Thank you very much. Good morning. Can everyone hear okay? They won't tell you if they can't. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. Right. Well, good morning from a, a very wet and windy county, Durham. Um, I'm going to provide an update on osmosis, which it's been a, a feature of the small craft industry now for over 40 years. And I really wanted to give an update as to what we've learned over that time uh, and how we can apply that to marine surveying. And we'll also be having a brief chat about moisture meters. Right, I'm trying to move the presentation on. So, I'm also going to talk about some common misconceptions and, as I mentioned, uh, using moisture meters. We'll also have a brief preview of the new Tramex Skipper 5 meter. Uh, this is a, a, a brand new instrument due out uh, early next year, which will provide a, a genuine dual depth functionality. So how does osmosis affect boats? Well, the obvious thing is that we have unsightly gel coat blistering. It mainly affects older GRP boats, but new builds are certainly not immune. It also significantly reduces resale values uh, to the point that in many cases, it can be quite difficult to sell boats that uh, have an osmotic condition. It's usually found below the waterline, but we also need to be aware that it can affect uh, wet areas uh, above the waterline, including top sides and decks. Uh, one of the, the key places to look is uh, areas on decks and coach roofs where water collects, uh, where there might be some uh, wet leaves or, or even coiled ropes. Uh, these, uh, these will often cause problems. Uh, and for those who perhaps aren't as familiar with GRP boats, that is, is what we're looking at. What osmosis doesn't do? Well, there's a lot of misconception, uh, misconceptions about osmosis. It's not a disease or a virus, not caused by electricity or pollution. Uh, and in fact, clean fresh water is actually a much bigger risk than uh, salt water. It's also not prevented by anti-foulings. It doesn't sink boats, uh, contrary to, uh, to some uh, common beliefs, uh, and it's certainly not confined to badly laid out hulls. One, th one thing um, I will mention, just an amusing story from the early days when, uh, when I first joined International Paint. Uh, I had a phone call from a, a chap, had a, a river cruiser on the, on the Thames, and he'd found a, a handful of blisters around the waterline uh, at the weekend, and he phoned up, and he was obviously a bit concerned about his boat, but he was actually much more concerned that when other boat owners found out about this, they tried to have his boat banned from the marina because there was a, a genuine concern at the time that this might be contagious and that it would affect other boats. Now, <laughs> thankfully, we, we now know that isn't the case, but it goes a long way to show how how much we've learned over the, the past 40 years. Uh, we also used to get regular calls from people who'd found blisters on boats during a, a scrub off. And they were thinking, well, you know, how am I going to save my boat? I've only got a couple of hours before the tide comes in. And they, they really thought that the boat would go under if, um, if it had a few blisters on it. Another big misconception is that osmotic fluids don't eat through the, uh, the hulls of GRP boats. This example here, if you can see the, the large pock marks in the hull, 
Uh, these were actually laid up on into the boat on day one. Uh, these were laid up um, in the mold. They are simply air voids, air inclusions um, that remain hidden for 20 or so years until this treatment was carried out. Uh, this particular boat, this was its third osmosis treatment. The, the first two treatments had clearly not gone deep enough and these voids had remained hidden. And it was only on the, the, the third treatment that the voids were exposed. Uh, and possibly the biggest misconception of all is that osmosis, it cannot be cured by drying out. Uh, since day one, the connection was made that osmosis was caused by water. Therefore, the logical conclusion was that to treat it, we need to keep water as far away from the boat as possible. And that if we can dry it out, then everything will be hunky-dory. Uh, but we now know that, that that certainly isn't the case. Uh, and it, and in fact, that uh, washing, regularly washing boats with plenty of clean, fresh water um, during the treatment process is actually one of the most uh, productive uses of time. So what have we learned? Well, firstly, osmosis is a natural aging process. So in many regards, uh, it's similar to corrosion in metal and rot in timber. And this is something that I think owners in particular need to bear in mind because uh, you know, it's, it's assumed that GRP will, will last forever and that if they find a few blisters in the hull, then it's got to be somebody's fault. Uh, usually the, uh, the whoever carried out the last survey but this isn't the case it, it's a natural aging process we also know that osmosis progresses very slowly in three distinct stages um, we'll talk a little bit about that later but the key thing is that any blisters that appear after 20 or 30 years they will have been developing for 20 or 30 years, not just the last few months. So it, it is a very slow uh, and long-term process. What are the causes? Well, there, there are a number of contributory factors to osmosis, but the main cause is hygroscopic solutes that are liberated from the gel coat uh, and or the layout resins uh, by long-term immersion in water. And it is these solutes, and not moisture, that we need to remove if our treatment is to be... <laughs> There's quite a lot of background noise. I don't know where it's coming from. The primary cause of osmosis is a material called propylene glycol. Uh, this is something that chemically is quite similar to uh, hydraulic brake fluid and uh, also which is a, a polyalkylene glycol ether uh, and also to uh, antifreeze which um, the non-toxic antifreezes in fact are based on propylene glycol. Uh, ethylene glycol is the nasty toxic stuff that is, is normally used. But the key properties are that this material is very strongly hygroscopic. It will absorb and retain moisture from any source. And it also has a, a very high boiling temperature, 190 degrees C. So you'll see that we can't remove this stuff simply by putting a few infrared heaters around a boat. Uh, and as a point of interest, uh, PG is very widely used as a humectant in cosmetic products, uh, everything from aftershaves, moisturizers, etc. Um, because of its moisture absorbing and retaining properties. <laughs> 
as an example, if we were to, to take a, a, an open beaker of propylene glycol, just leave it in a, a normal environment, and over time it will absorb more and more moisture uh, until eventually the beaker will, will overflow. And it has a very similar behavior in GRP laminates. I actually did an experiment with uh, beakers of plain water and propylene glycol just left on a shelf in, uh, in my garage, similar conditions to a, a boat yard. And we can see here how propylene glycol absorbs moisture over time, whereas of course water gradually evaporates. It's also interesting if we look through the, um, the graph, we can see that we have peaks and troughs, and this relates to weather conditions during the experiment. So during February, it was wet and windy, very humid. But then when we get to April, we find that the moisture content uh, actually drops. And of course, we see this very much in GRP boats, uh, particularly those boats where there have been attempts to dry them with uh, infrared heaters and dehumidifiers that as soon as we turn the, uh, the heat off, then of course the, the moisture content rises again. Now, the key question is, how on earth does this propylene glycol get into the, the GRP in the first place? Well, polyester resins uh, made by a process of esterification. And this process produces quite a lot of water. Uh, in fact, about a third of the batch at one point will be water from the, the, the water of esterification. Now, moisture, as you should know, inhibits the cure of polyester resins. You cannot cure polyesters in damp conditions. If you have damp chopped mat, for example, then we could get quite serious under cure. So glycol is added to the batch of resin to scavenge moisture. Now the, the process, uh, it's, it's quite complex, but the batch will be heated to quite a high temperature, typically uh, 70 or 80 degrees centigrade. Glycol is added and the moisture boils off with the, the glycol uh, in a kind of reflux process. Uh, this process is actually done under high vacuum to reduce the, the boiling point of the glycol. Now, usually the glycol is completely removed before the batch is filled out into drums, but this depends very much on the intended use of the resin. Bear in mind that polyester resins are used for, you know, they have numerous applications beyond the marine industry. Uh, and we know that boat builders don't always use marine resins. Particularly in the past, we know that uh, polyesters um, that have been intended for industrial applications, uh, even making bathtubs, etc., cetera, um, will, be, uh, will have been used to, to build boats. And of course, we, we don't realize there's a problem until later. So, um, having understood that part of the story, uh, we should now understand that the osmotic process is not reversible. We cannot cure osmosis simply by drying out. Now, moisture meters are an integral part of this operation. Um, these should be used to look for moisture that's absorbed and retained by the solutes. They are not osmosis meters. Uh, Another key consideration is the lifespan of osmosis treatments. 
Uh, these typically have a, a lifespan of about 10 or 15 years at best. Occasionally, you'll, you'll find one that's been on for 20, 25 years. Um, but a lot of these treatments fail at uh, maybe eight to 10 years. So bearing that in mind, the sooner an osmosis treatment is carried out, the sooner it will fail. So if you can delay the treatment for five years, then you'll have another five years before the next treatment is required. Now, that makes a lot of sense, particularly if, as we'll see, that, that delay improves the outlook for the treated hull. We should also remember that osmosis has very little or no effect on the mechanical strength and integrity of most GRP hulls. Um, there's, uh, there's usually quite a lot of redundancy in designs. And we now know that a lot of boats have been sailed perfectly safely for many years with, uh, with a few blisters on, on the hulls. So if, uh, if the hull condition is regularly monitored, then there's no reason why a boat shouldn't remain in, uh, in use until treatment is actually warranted. So that could allow another five or 10 years before major work is required. And it could also provide a, a bit of work for the surveyor um, to go back and, and keep a, an eye on the boat maybe every year or two uh, until such time as, uh, as work is actually justified. <coughs> So, as I've already alluded, uh, treatment is more likely to be successful if the condition is allowed to continue until it's fairly advanced. So, in other words, uh, indicated by quite widespread blistering, and these will usually be larger blisters, uh, fluid-filled. Um, if, uh, if they're opened up, they'll be... Uh, a bit of greasy, sticky fluid inside, uh, maybe a, a smell of acetic acid. That's not always the case with newer boats. Now, the reason for delaying the treatment is very simply that the solutes responsible for blistering will be far more dilute and hence easier to remove at this later stage. Equally, treatment is more likely to be successful if it started promptly at the end of a sailing season. So by the same token, it's not a good idea to try and treat a boat that's been on hard standing for maybe two or three years uh, waiting for somebody to buy her. Quite often, I hear of cases where a, a boat's been on hard standing uh, it's been, been up for sale. Surveyor comes along, says, yep, sound boat, but it's got osmosis. You really need to get it treated before you put the boat afloat. Uh, in my view, that is wrong. It would actually be far better to use the boat, uh, at least for a season, so that the, the solutes are in a, a dilute state uh, and therefore mobile because it makes them much easier to remove. Uh, it's not easy to remove solutes from a dry hull. And for the same reasons, premature treatment is usually unsuccessful. Uh, again, this comes down to limited mobility of solutes, um, makes them very difficult to remove. Historically, if we go back to the 1980s and 1990s, uh, a lot of boats were condemned on the basis of nothing more than high moisture readings. Uh, in many cases, these boats didn't even have any blisters, but uh, surveyors prescribed full osmosis treatments, and invariably, these boats came back with blisters within quite a short period. Uh, 
uh, it was simply because with the knowledge at the time uh, and also the lack of mobility of, of solutes, uh, it made them very difficult to remove. So what is osmosis? Well, the classic definition is equalization of solution strengths by passage of a solvent through a semi-permeable membrane. And we have a, a, a hypothetical chamber here. The semi-permeable membrane for our purposes could be a, a GRP composite or a piece of gel coat. As long as the solution on both sides of the chamber has the, the same density, then nothing will happen. But if we make one side of the chamber, uh, if, if we add a solute to it, it could be salt or sugar or our propylene glycol, then there will be a, a movement of water through the semi-permeable membrane in an effort to equalize the solution strengths. Depending on the strength of that solution, it, this process can produce quite high pressures. Uh, four atmospheres or 60 psi uh, is not unusual. And so over a prolonged period, then inevitably that can cause some quite severe blistering. We cannot reverse this process, except if we make the other chamber even more uh, concentrated, then that will drive the process into reverse. Uh, also, if we were to apply a pressure greater than the osmotic pressure uh, onto the chamber on this side, then we would force the solvent back through the membrane rather like a, a reverse osmosis uh, water treatment system. Not everything that blisters though has osmosis. Uh, wicking, for example, um, is a, a common cause of, of blistering and it's not necessarily uh, related to osmosis. It's an entirely separate process. The two examples at the top here uh, we can see some prominent fibers uh, that have been exposed simply by sanding off anti-fouling. Now, these will, will blister and swell uh, when, uh, when the boat's in the water for, for long enough. One key difference between osmotic blisters and blisters caused by uh, wicking is that Osmotic blisters tend to remain for usually weeks or months after the boat is lifted up, lifted out of the water. By contrast, uh, wicking, the blisters tend to disappear quite quickly. Uh, they'll very often disappear within a week of lifting out uh, and may be missed altogether depending on when the, the survey is carried out. The example at the bottom here, um, this again is not osmosis. We simply have a, a lot of unbound glass immediately behind the gel coat. Um, this provides a, an ideal reaction chamber for the osmotic process, but even in the absence of solutes, when moisture gets in there, then the gel coat will swell. And as we, we see in this example here, this is actually gel coat above the waterline at the, uh, the aft end of a, a sailing yacht. And you can see here these swollen fiber bundles where the, uh, the, the fibers are actually swelling uh, along the, uh, you can actually track the fibers there. Another interesting thing with this boat is we can see from this blister here that's been dug out that actually the gel coat is very thick. Although the, uh, the, the recommended thickness is about 500 microns, uh, the, uh, the true 
thickness of gel coats can often exceed that by many times. Uh, I've seen gel coats of three or four millimeters thickness before now. So your role as a marine surveyor, firstly, is to provide a clear, objective, honest and meaningful report uh, to your client. Uh, and also to provide impartial advice on treatment, and I would stress non-treatment options. Uh, in, in my view, it's always a good idea to give two or three different options, uh, including treatment and uh, non-treatment, just keeping an eye on the situation. In particular, there's a lot of older GRP boats around now, uh, that actually have quite low monetary value. Uh, and so to recommend a treatment that's possibly going to cost more than the boat is worth um, is, uh, is not always a, a welcome, op welcome option. And again, to provide sufficient clear information for the client to make an informed decision of his own, um, which is not the same as telling the client what to do. Uh, and I would also stress that surveyors should not be seen to cover butt at the expense of their client, uh, obviously to have vested interests, um, or particularly to obfuscate or submit meaningless reports. Uh, one of the most common complaints that I have about surveyors is that, you know, the report actually doesn't say anything. Um, it's written in such a way that, you know, really there's, there's no cogent conclusion uh, to be reached from, from what has been said, uh, possibly in, a, in a, an attempt to, uh, a misguided attempt to avoid any uh, liability. So our visual examination, obviously, conduct thorough visual examination, looking for blisters, swelling, cracks, etc. cetera. Um, this is always best carried out within a few hours of lifting. Uh, if there is any uh, blistering or swelling to be seen, then it's going to be visible at an early stage, uh, far more visible um, shortly after lifting uh, than it will be a few days later. It's also very much more visible whilst the hull is still wet. So if you can get a, a good view of the boat uh, as soon as pressure washing is completed, then that is the best time for a visual examination. Pay particular attention to stressed areas, uh, waterline, bows, quarters, etc. Um, one of the things I've noticed with uh, bilge keel boats in particular is that blisters very often develop around the center line uh, just forward of the keels. And it, it seems that the, the stress created by the keels actually encourages and accelerates uh, osmosis and blistering in that area. Uh, of course, water lines they are stressed and also the water temperature is slightly higher in that area and that also accelerates any blistering processes. Sounding of course is, a, is still a useful test and we need to remove anti-fouling coupons from some representative areas to make, um, make a note of the paint coatings applied to the hull. Um, this is actually quite important um, because very often there's, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty about what is on the bottom of the boat. Does it have an epoxy? Has it just been anti-fouled? Are there years and years worth of anti-fouling? Uh, also on this subject, I'm always very wary of boats that are offered for sale with a fresh coat of anti-fouling applied. Uh, a coat or two of anti-fouling covers all number of sins. Um, so, you know, take extra care. Coupons. These are 
small patches of anti-fouling removed from the hole to expose the gel coat. Uh, scrape them off with a blunt wood chisel. Uh, make sure that you don't shave off any blisters or swellings. Uh, hence why uh, a blunt chisel. The purpose, very simply, to allow us a, a closer examination of the gel coat. Uh, we may also want to check the moisture readings in the absence of an anti-fouling layer. Um, although, to be fair, a lot of meters now uh, will actually read through anti-foulings, provided they're dry and provided that they're not too thick. Uh, this first example here, uh, it doesn't matter whether the boat's blistered or not. You can see that there's some uh, crazing in the gel coat and a crazed gel coat will obviously not be a waterproof gel coat. So we can expect high moisture readings. Um, this is, um, you know, ideally the gel coat would be removed and replaced with an epoxy scheme. Uh, an example here, firstly, we can see that there's a very long history of anti-foulings here. Uh, quite a few seasons of red and then some blue. But if we look at the exposed surface, we can see that there are some small blisters there. These are uh, about the size of the, uh, the blunt end of a ball tip pen. And of course, moisture readings are also important. As I mentioned earlier, the key thing here is that we need to be looking for moisture that's absorbed and retained by solutes within the laminate, and which may in time cause blistering. There's no guarantee here, but you know we do know after 40 odd years that boats that are wet have a much higher risk of blistering than those that give uh, dry readings. These are some suggested readings. Uh, if I can encourage you to download my shorter guide to osmosis, and you'll find uh, all of this information, um, you'll find all of this information in that document. Um, I've also forwarded to some documents to Mike uh, for download with this information. Also talk briefly about resin types because these are, are quite relevant. The, the first uh, polyester resins were orthothallics, uh, ortho simply meaning orthodox. These were used from the 1950s uh, until the early 1990s. They're still used as layup resins and they're perfectly good in that application. Um, but they do have quite high moisture absorption and so they're much more prone to osmosis. They also tend to show high moisture readings for quite a long time after lifting out. So bear that in mind, if you know the age of the boat, you'll have some idea as to whether or not it's been laid up throughout with ortho resins. Isothalic resins, uh, these are a, a newer resin. They were developed in the late 1980s. And these, uh, it's an isomer of phthalic acid is, is used in the production of the resins. And these provide a, a very much lower moisture absorption than the older ortho resins. And so they're much less prone to develop osmotic symptoms. They'll often show acceptable moisture readings within an hour or two of lifting, but this isn't guaranteed. So you know, don't jump to conclusions. If you're finding that the readings are, are still high uh, an hour or two after lifting, I would always look for other causes. Uh, epoxies, they're usually uh, used for repair uh, and in some advanced composites, usually specials, racing craft, etc. Uh, 
Uh, these have very low moisture transmission rates, but they do often show very high moisture readings for several months after lifting out. So again, if you know the boat has got a, a epoxy on the bottom of it, um, high moisture readings don't necessarily tell you anything at all. What I would say is that any boat that's had an epoxy applied for three or four seasons and isn't showing any symptoms of blistering, then that it's in itself is a very good indication that the hull is in good sound condition underneath. We'll move on to the hot vac system, which some of you may have come across. Uh, this uh, was developed by a, a surveyor on the east coast of the UK, a chap called Terry Davy. He came along to one of my lectures at Plymouth University some years ago, and he was fascinated by what I said. And he said, well, there's got to be an engineering solution to this. And he came up with this system that uh, basically uses a combination of heat and high vacuum to va vaporize glycol at temperature that doesn't destroy the laminate. And that's the key thing. The TG, glass transition temperature, or uh, to put it simply, the melting point of polyester resins is around about 80 centigrade. So any temperature above that is going to soften uh, and ultimately destroy the hull. So the hot vac system, this uses a, a, some highly compliant heated blankets. These are silicon rubber blankets and they follow the hull profile very closely. There's also special blankets for uh, bowels, skin fittings uh, and uh, other odd areas. This is a, a hot back system in use at the, uh, the Fox's boat yard at Ipswich. And this is a, a three channel system. You can see there's three uh, hot vac blankets here. This is the vacuum takeoff in the center of the blanket. And we also have uh, an electrical uh, umbilical connection. And these blankets heat the hull to a temperature typically about 85 or 90 degrees centigrade. And they, uh, the, the system provides a, a vacuum, typically about four or five millibars absolute. So a closer view of the blanket. This curve here, and it shows the boiling point of glycol uh, at uh, different atmospheric pressures. And we can see here that if we can get the pressure down below 10 millibars absolute, then we can actually vaporize it at about 85 degrees centigrade. So the result is that we get very rapid drying. So we're looking at three or four hours typical um, for the application of each blanket. Um, compare that to three or four months, um, which is, is quite typical with, uh, with conventional methods. Hot vac doesn't increase cure. It cannot increase cure um, because the, uh, the essential reactive uh, elements of the resin have long gone by this time, um, but it may increase the apparent hardness, uh, the barcoal hardness, for example, of a resin um, because it removes moisture. Water, moisture is actually a, a plasticizer to uh, polyester resins and in fact most resins. And by removing the moisture, we also increase the transparency of the, uh, the resin. So it's, hot vac has proved very effective on problem boats. Uh, and it's also helpful when repairing cord hulls. Uh, but uh, a certain amount of caution is needed there because 
if the outer skin is perforated, then there is a danger that we can actually collapse the, uh, the, the void uh, or the, the, uh, the sandwich. So um, a bit more information uh, needs to be sought there um, before wading in. But the great thing is that we know within 24 hours whether this is going to work. Finally, um, I'd like to talk briefly about moisture meters. Uh, the first uh, meter in the marine market was the, the Sovereign back in 1983. That was the first non-destructive moisture meter for marine use. Um, very popular meter, but it has a very shallow depth of field, and I don't think anybody realized this for quite a long time. The Tramex Skipper was launched in 1987. It was a more compact design. It initially was less popular with surveyors. It wasn't as technical a uh, looking instrument, not quite as impressive, um, but it gave a much greater depth of field. Uh, and so actually was a, was a far more useful instrument in most applications. It's important to understand that all of the moisture meters that we use today originated from the construction industry. So they were designed for use on timber and masonry, which are, they're all homogenous materials. So any moisture is quite evenly distributed. GRP by comparison is a laminar material. So moisture isn't always where we expect to see it. If we look at the schematic of a typical moisture meter, and we can see that the depth of field is governed by the gap between the electrodes. So in this case, we've got widely spaced electrodes and the field penetrates uh, quite some distance into the, the hull down towards the bilges. I apologize that the words are upside down there. So the gap between the electrodes dictates the maximum depth of penetration. Uh, and in practice, the, uh, the depth of field is, is roughly equivalent to the gap divided by two. Uh, so if you've got a, an instrument with a narrow gap, it's a bit like trying to measure a, a four inch crank journal with a one inch micrometer. Uh, you just can't do it. So if we compare the, uh, the sovereign scanning head, and these are the two electrodes that are used. Uh, the outer is redundant, and the gap between those is two and a half millimeters. Uh, the, the current instrument uses the, the same specification. This is the Tramex meter, and here we've got this much wider gap. Uh, the gap there is, uh, is about 20, 22, 23 millimeters. Now, in the construction industry, that really wouldn't matter um, because the moisture is evenly distributed. Now, I have previously done a, a, a short demonstration, um, but here I've got a short video. No sound on that video, Nigel. Is there no sound? I can't hear any sound coming through, no. Okay, well, I'll speak over it. <laughs> okay. We've got some ordinary chop strand mat here. And I've got a, a beaker with some fluid. There's water, propylene glycol, and some acetic acid. And I'm going to pour that into the bag so that we've got some sodden mat. We've also got a series of GRP or gel coat shims of different thickness. So I'm going to pour the water 
into the uh, into the bag. The bag is purely to stop the mess on the table. So we can see that's nicely uh, nicely wetted there. When you put a moisture meter on, you would expect to get a, a high reading, um, which we did. And if we put the sovereign meter on, again, we've got a high reading. So all of those instruments are showing off scale, which we would expect because we've got this very soggy material. Now I'm going to put a, a gel coat shim in place. And if we put the Tremex meter on, we're still getting an off-scale reading. Remember, this is the instrument with the wide spacing. But if we use the Sovereign meter, which has got very shallow, uh, very narrow spacing, we get a much lower reading. This is the, uh, the new quantum meter. And irrespective of whether we use shallow or deep, we're still getting quite low readings. Remember, I mentioned earlier the thickness of gel coat on boats. Uh, that first piece is a millimeter thick. We're now putting a, a second uh, thickness of a millimeter. We're still getting a, 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 an off scale reading with the Tremex. But if we then go in with the sovereign meters, we're getting an even lower reading. And the worry here is that if you've got a thick gel coat on a boat, it's quite easy to be fooled into thinking that actually this boat is perfectly dry. There's nothing wrong with it, but we've just seen that we've got quite soggy GRP underneath. Nigel, a question from Guy. How thick is the GRP, please? The, the shims, uh, the first one was one millimeter. The second was 1.4. Thank you. Okay. So from, from that, we can see that moisture measurement is not an exact science. Uh, it's more than approximation. Uh, and there's little correlation between the brands of meter for exactly the reason that I've just demonstrated. If we were looking at homogeneous materials, there's a lot more correlation. But on laminar materials, you cannot get them to correlate simply because they're looking at different samples. So these are not osmosis meters. And for our purposes, reliability, stability, repeatability are more important uh, attributes. I promised you a, a sneak preview of the new uh, Skipper 5. This is a, a, a brand new design uh, based on the uh, existing instrument. We've got a, a, an ergonom ergonomic case. Um, we've got genuine deep and shallow modes with this instrument. It's actually got three electrodes on the back. And it's also got Bluetooth. So we've got Bluetooth data out, and there's free apps for Android and iOS, uh, and also a handy extension handle. I, I can't show you today, but um, they will be, uh, they'll be available soon. The beauty with the Android and iOS apps is that we can actually do drawings in the app, and the readings can follow that. So we can draw something a bit like a boat, and then fill in the readings. And then on the back of the meter, we can see here, we've got the two big electrodes, as we have on the existing instrument, but we've then got this third smaller electrode. So the shallow readings are taken between these two, and the deep readings are taken between those two. So the dual depth is actually by hardware and not by software. Uh, the electrodes themselves are silicon rubber uh, and the new meter also has AA cells 
for a longer life. So look out for more information on, on that very shortly. And that is it. Thank you very much. Um, please go to passionforpaint.co.uk to learn more and to have a look at some of the other things that we do. Thank you. Nigel, thank you very much indeed. Um, whilst we have Nigel for another couple of minutes, is, uh, do you want to have any questions for him about osmosis or moisture meters? Um, so Guy would like to ask you, do you have any thoughts on the proteometer aquant? Uh, the protometer, it, it was a, a moderately popular instrument um, going back 10, 15 years or so. Um, unfortunately, it's, although as a meter, it, it works perfectly well, um, nobody really seems to have any kind of handle on the uh, interpreting the readings. Yeah. Um, uh, Guy goes on to say, seems to read remarkably deep, but ignore the surface useful for hoist and holds and so on. Yes, yes. Um, the Aquant meter that I have actually has something called a field concentrator that comes with it. Um, the concept is that without the field concentrator, that it actually uses the surveyor's body as part of the circuit. So that's uh, that's a, a bit of a shortcoming. It does work at quite a, a high frequency. It's, it runs at around one meg. Um, so it's a much higher frequency than the other instruments. Uh, but when you're standing holding the meter, your body is forming part of the circuit. So depending on the conditions, um, depending if the boat's on a trailer, if it's propped up, if the props are, are wet, if conditions are wet, then you'll probably get higher readings than in dry conditions. Um, when you add the field concentrator, then the thing becomes self-contained and it behaves more like the Tramex or the Sovereign meters that we've already seen. Nigel, I have a question and a comment. Uh, the question is, how do new materials such as carbon affect the results? And the comment is from Chris Holmes is some American boats use a vinyl ester layer below the gel coat. These boats tend to give high readings. Okay, um, carbon fiber will always give high readings with any moisture meter. Uh, carbon fiber is conductive um, and unfortunately there's no workaround for that. So carbon fiber equals high moisture readings. Um, Two other things I'll mention, copper bot obviously tends to give high or higher readings, although depending on how thick it is, you can often get a useful gauge, um, you know, particularly if there's variations around the boat, uh, you may get some idea as to whether or not the, uh, the hull is actually wet underneath. Um, Kevlar, I'll also mention, Kevlar itself is not conductive. However, the, um, the Kevlar fibers, they're sometimes processed uh, with graphite or they'll be coated with graphite. And of course, graphite is conductive and that will also give high moisture readings. So in those cases, you, you've obviously got to either discount the readings or, um, or treat them with caution.